Good afternoon, everybody. It is Friday and the 6th of October. You're here at Lunch and Learn. Well, Richard, let's talk about, what's a good topic to talk about? How about dementia? My screen showing? Yep, we can see it looks like a map. That would maybe be yeah. a dementia map. Luke is down in South America. He's mapping uh, people. Uh, we're we're um, funding him for research in ayahuasca and uh, psychedelics and brain mapping, and he's working on projects down there. He'll be doing a lunch and learn and posting an article in the near future on the uh, um, New Mind Journal. But uh, he had a person who came in with a dementia and he was asking me questions about it. And uh, a lot of times people ask questions about dementia and and dementia and stroke have a lot of commonalities, you can imagine, because um, TIAs uh, are these little uh, blockages that occur all throughout, really tiny ones, and they cause uh, fine destruction, which slowly degrades your function and also um, creates a lot of inflammation because it, it, gen it, it, it uh, generates a, uh, an inflammatory response in the white matter particularly. And we know from Kanyazov's research that uh, if you see uh, a lot of inflammation, you're going to get a lot of delta in, in the brain waves. Uh, that's what he asserts from a meta-analysis of the literature on um, inflammation. Um, Niedermeyer and Lopez de Silva, who are, wrote, do the Bible of, of EEG from the medical community, um, basically say the same thing. Um, trying to get this information if you're at a meeting or from somebody over the years has been nearly impossible. I don't know that these a lot of people in neurofeedback read outside the field of the professional literature. It seems like they don't because so many people are surprised when they find these things out, you know. And what amazes me is, is we should have been informed of all this stuff by people who were senior in the field 20 years ago because this was all known 20 years ago. Um, but I thought I, I'd bring up... Um, the patterns in um, dementia, because people ask me about it quite often, and, and uh, is this dementia or what's it look like? And uh, uh, interestingly enough, um, Pritchett, Leslie Pritchett in 1994, New York Medical University, did a study. I mean, it was, it was like, I forget what the 600 people and she tracked dementia, the stages, with QEG and wrote up the article. Mm, cool. So it, look up Leslie Pritchett, 1994, and you'll find one on it, amazingly enough. But those never circulated the meetings. Nobody ever talked about her work on it or anything. Uh, it was amazing that people just... And then they walked around going like, oh, what's dementia look like? Or asking people and like, well, we don't know. Well, read the medical literature, maybe? <laughs> the EEG <laughs> literature? <laughs> yeah, and, that's, that's interesting. You know, one of the topics that I'm, I'll be sending out, and I find this interesting because it, it, they make it sound so unique. The, the title of this article will be uh, Neuroinflammation is Linked to Dementia Risk in Parkinson's Disease. I am so so shocked. <laughs> I mean, now, why would they I just mean, take out the Parkinson's disease and leave it as a link to dementia risk? Period. But I well, guess they need to focus one, on that. That's been known since last century. Why is it news? It's, I don't get it. I've been teaching that for twenty years and treating it, and I yeah, it's well, it amazing. Supports what you're yeah, it supports what you're saying about just, you know, information being out there and we're just somehow making it sound like it's all brand new. 
<laughs> oh, we are. So much of it. It takes takes decades for the stuff to get to the doctors. Um, and we know 17 years on average to get to PCs. Yep. Right. Now, you hope the specialists get it quicker. But in 1989, um, Hughes... Uh, did functional studies on functional decline, looking at the EEG and testing people at stages. The Hughes was a he came to the meeting, but he, he only talked about ADD and and uh, um, the controversy of w whether spikes and sharp waves um, were significant, and he clarified. To all the people in the meeting that neurology is divided. A lot of people have spikes in their EEG and sharp waves, and they are fine. It's you don't know for sure, you know. So if you see one, and it doesn't mean necessarily mean anything, but there are people who are in the neurofeedback and QEG who apparently don't read this stuff, and they think, oh, it's a very serious thing if there's a spike. Well, it might be, you know, um, but some kids with temporal spikes show symptoms and some don't. So it's obviously not the only thing that's important, but it is one thing. Um, and this is why I'm against people in neurofeedback get, getting into too much into raw EEG. It's a real skill. It takes years and you've got to be taught by the experts. It's not something you get in a workshop. Um, but um, the dementia is very clearly well understood. And, and, uh, and there are a lot of other studies from 1985, 1987. I mean, that's 20th century. This stuff is all known, which I'm going to tell you. It's been known since that time, which you've, if you've never heard of it, is because there's nobody in the neurofeedback community teaching it. Um, but it's always been there. Um, so that's why I, it's a good idea to read um, the medical stuff, the medical literature. Anyways, um, it clearly um, bears out Kanyazov's statement that if there's a 90% chance if of inflammation uh, if you're showing delta in the EEG, you know? And by delta, he means consistent delta, eyes open or eyes closed. It's gotta be very marked. And, uh, and it tends to be localized over the area where there is inflammation. So it can be really focal, like in head injuries and coup contre coup or regional, like in to metal toxicities, we have frontal slowing delta um, from lead and mercury that causes frontal delta. Or it can be global if you've got a sleep um, a disorder with eyes open, it, it may not show up in at all in eyes closed with sleep disorder. Uh, but global is a state of change. If you put somebody through alpha theta training and they um, have a crossover and then they stay crossed over and then they go down even more where the theta goes below the alpha and it stays there and suddenly the delta and theta climbs up and you see that you can see the theta getting high it's that's happening globally it's not locally where your sensor is that's a global because you're changing state you're going to stage one stage two of the sleep and uh, and that's why you, know, you have to know the ins and outs when you look at a map. Um, so if you've got a map with eyes closed and no delta, but eyes open and lots of delta, that's a failure to shift state. And that's what happens when you don't get enough sleep. That's the most common. Now, there could be exotic reasons, a syndrome of one of the 3,000 known syndrome. I don't actually know how many thousands there are but nobody can know all of them. So if somebody casually says a syndrome to you, like you should know, you should know that they don't know that. <laughs> and they're just, you know, either being rude or um, trying to put,
put you on the spot or I got you. And they do that at meetings. You know, people always play one-upmanship. Uh, sad to say, we're all here to get informed. At any rate, um, it is uh, uh, known that um, the first signs of a increased uh, of dementia is it's like depression. You know, um, and I'm talking eyes closed here because you can get state changes which throw all of this information off. They're talking about, um, and you should confirm with eyes closed and eyes open that it stays there. You know, somebody can have, for instance, in decreases in posterior alpha, but increases in anterior alpha. So alpha gets low in the front, uh, low in the back, but higher in the front. That's one of the signs of dementia um, in the EEG. But you should see that pattern in the eyes closed and the eyes open. And that's the first pattern. But that a lot of things, if you had um, um, uh, serious trauma, that that would show up as low alpha, and then you had trouble sleeping. It could show up with, with frontal alpha, and it could look the same. So you really have to know the person's history before you go thinking it's dementia in the early stages, anyways. And then as it um, advances, the alpha slows considerably. And the alpha slows so much, um, as you know, and as I often say, it starts to show up as delta in the delta filters, because the delta filters are dumb. They don't anything that comes in their, their range, they just show them, and it could be slowed alpha, and the delta will, filters will pick it up and, and show it like delta in the map. So slowing is always a major problem. And um, when you see slowing in the EEG, um, you've got a problem, no matter what anybody says about anything. It's not right. Um, and there have been people who've done fat, uh, alpha training, fast alpha training, 10 to 12, with a lot of these different disorders and gotten some improvements. So it's it's always a possibility to um, train slowed alpha into fast alpha if the person responds and get an improvement in function. And it's not like, you know, you have to do an ROI or, you know, oh, we got to find the location. A lot of stuff in the brain, just if you train in one area, it affects the whole brain. And if you train at CZ, it really affects the whole brain because it goes right down to the thalamic cortical loops in the oldest part of the brain and affects the whole brain. And all of the studies, Parkinson's attention um, deficit, um, uh, stroke, dementia, all of them show uh, efficacy training at CZ with SMR. <laughs> and um, most of them show the same thing with fast alpha, you know, 10, 12 hertz alpha. So it's really moving the whole brain um, to uh, a higher level of function when you speed up the alpha. And the brain doesn't function right when it's slowed alpha. And uh, I spent 20 years trying to convince everybody of that. And uh, finally got some backing from Jay Gunkelman on it, oddly enough. Though he's a fan of that literature, apparently, too. So when here you've got a case in this particular map of, uh, of a guy with dementia. And he's somewhat functional. He traveled to South America. But... He's losing, uh, I mean, he lose, he's got a companion which helps keep him in line. And 
he's got some serious memory loss. And here you see there's just a little glimmer of low alpha in the back. And you've got theta and it's frontal, but it's actually slowed alpha. So his alpha, some of his alpha slowed down so much it's theta and some of it is still okay, which can happen. I mean, your brain has got multiple um, regions of, uh, of generators of frequencies, and there can be slow alpha and fast alpha close to the same areas. Uh, and so you can have both occurring at the same time. Something that was confusing to me till I really took a deep dive into electrophysiology um, and the medical literature. But here you have the frontal alpha in an advanced stage. It was here, and it was probably lower in the back, and now it's here. And then um, the more adv advanced um, it is, the more delta there is, because there's more inflammation in the white matter and probably the gray matter, and um, you're getting a lot of uh, delta globally. It's diffuse. And so the advanced version of it will always be diffused. Um, and there you've got it right there in delta. And uh, this applies to Lewy body dementia as well as Alzheimer's and regular dementia. Now, Alzheimer's would probably have more um, yellow in the temporal lobes. But this is so, um, this is above three standard deviations, and we're not measuring beyond that, and it may be. But uh, this is a clinical map for neurofeedback, not for diagnosis. And I designed the maps to keep people in line. They don't go trying to do stuff that they're not qualified to do. Uh, if you're wondering, with the the beta and uh, the high beta, um, this is from muscle tension. So he's tense in the, in the temporalis muscle here, a little bit on the left side, and you see its reflection in the subharmonics of the beta. Okay, any questions? It still holds the same and principle. If, holds. if we're eyes open, we'd be seeing something very similar with delta. Is what you're saying, if I understand correctly? Uh, it sh it'd probably be worse. Be worse. As, okay. As a matter of fact, wait, wait a second. See if I've got. I may have confused these. Oh, there's one. Uh, that's eyes closed. The next one over, as I'm seeing it, as you pull it to your to your right, dementia, Q. No yeah, other direction. Are, yeah, these are the same ones. Okay, and then there's, oh, there's two. I, I see. Yes, eyes closed, eyes closed, it's the same app. Here we go. There's eyes open. Woo! There's, there's our eyes open. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so. Uh, so, this is interesting. I mean, we're talking about dementia, or you're talking about dementia. Um, but, you know, some of these maps I see even on younger kids. So, is it? I mean, do they have early onset dementia? Ask your husband, because he was at all my lectures on the oxidative stress and the EEG. But okay. I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I'll spare you. Okay. He's a, busy, he's a busy person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She'd have to he, wait for a month. He, <laughs> he didn't. He didn't tell you. Um, yeah, he but, didn't. <laughs> uh, no, you. No, it doesn't. It just means there's there's um in in really little kids like five years old, six years old, and seven years old. Uh -huh. um, it just means there's an inflammatory process. Mm -hmm. Younger than that, delta will be, it can just by happenstance be higher because that delta and theta dominates the, the childhood map until they're about four years old. Mm -hmm. But if it's there afterwards, that means um, they're likely uh, some inflammatory process 
and the reasons, I mean, what causes inflammation, you, as a medical professional, there's a ton of things that cause. They may um, have a, a gluten sensitivity, and you may be dealing with ASD. And right. You take them off the gluten, and Delta disappears, and they suddenly wake up. Mm -hmm. that, that's happened to a lot of people I've mentored um, with their children. It's true. Uh, uh, and so uh, I've heard it so many times, the story, uh, at least a percentage of the population responds that way. Mm -hmm. And that tells you something that neurofeedback and diet, you can fight inflammation. Right, right. And the researchers who trained SMR or fast alpha, they just trained in the middle, CZ or um, C3, C4, and they got significant changes in cognitive function as measured by P300, by um, uh, cognitive, you know, formal measuring, cognitive uh, testing, uh, and changes in the EEG. So you can make changes. That doesn't mean you can you know, the person's going to be normal and, you know, you get over it. Um, I mean, if you're dealing with children and, and, and you can expect really good change, over 50%. But with an adult, you might only get like 30, 40% improvement. It depends on how, how, they, how they follow the um, um, necessary lifestyle changes to fight the dementia. I mean, they have done some small studies where they've, um, with older people, where they've given them, them the right kind of exercise, uh, ballroom dancing, and supplements, um, and uh, uh, done all, you know, checked their, their uh, the health measures, made, made their, uh, got the triglycerides and their blood sugar A1C down and uh, reduced inflammation in their body and they've begun to reverse dementia. So it can be done. It's been demonstrated. How much? Well, that's all over the map because everybody's different. Their health profile's different and it depends on whether they're following the program or not and being honest. But you can do it. And if you throw neurofeedback in there, that that makes a big difference. I mean, if, if you've got a um, a problem with physiology, your knee or your shoulder or something, and the doctor gives you cortisone and you rely on the cortisone only, you know, well, it'll help for a while. It might help, uh, might keep it down for quite a while. Depends on the issue. But if you actually exercise the area appropriately, you know, with a physical therapist, that'll be a lot more powerful in the long run than the cortisone, uh, generally speaking. You know, so it's, exercise is critical. One of the key features about uh, the dementia population is they find a high correlation between dementia and lack of physical exercise. There's also, um, high correlation between dementia and uh, long-term reliance on uh, psychoactive drugs. So all those things you're taking for anxiety and depression and all these other things, um, they, in the long run, accelerate the possibility of dementia. And that's, many studies have, have shown that, big ones. and early, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So we That's know that. Scary. That's a scary stat. You think about what's going to happen down oh. the road. <laughs> it's, it's terrible. That's why I like, I feel, try to get people off those things. And mm -hmm. I tell them, you, you, if you can, stay off them. We know that A1C, high levels of A1C are really common. Uh, and they believe is a contributor. People with extreme microbiome disorders, um, 
having uh, GI disorders, um, they'll uh, contribute uh, a major <coughs> amount of the variance to the studies on dementia. But again, bio, or, you know, bio, uh, microbiome uh, problems come from lack of diet, lack of exercise, <laughs> too much sugar. I mean, lack of a good diet, having too much sugar in your uh, diet, uh, too many carbohydrates. All these things are major contributors. So it's diet and exercise are two of the major contributors and psychoactive drugs is a third major contributor. And if that's a scary topic. Yeah. Really, so, you know, I was going to share as you're talking about that, that is that the, there's another article I'll send out in about 10 days, and it's called, the title of that one is Stress, Depression, and Risk of Dementia, a Cohort Study in the Total Population Between 18 and 65 Years Old out of Stockholm. So they're, they're telling you that just having those disorders increases your risk, and then you throw some medication on top, and bingo. Well, what do you take? What do they promote for those disorders? That's exactly I mean, what I'm saying. Yeah, it's I, it, you, that's right in Whitaker's book. Yeah, um, and he cites all the studies. <laughs> it's a truckload of them, and you can read them yourself. Um, and uh, the, they kick the can down the road. Oh, you got a problem now? Well, yeah, this is acute. We got to take care of it now. We'll give you the drug. We, you know. It's known that it causes a side effects you know, down. If, if, if you don't get off this, you'll have it'll contribute to dementia. But we're going to get you some therapy, except people don't stay in therapy or their insurer won't cover it for the time years it requires. And the people just end up staying on the drug. And then what happens? You know. You see, it. it it won't guarantee you have dementia, but it contributes a substantial amount of the variance to the uh, pool. Mm. So that's, I, I mean, that's, that's scary for all of us because it's uh, like 5% from 60, from the age of 60 to 80, it's about 5% of the population's at risk. Once you get over 80 uh, to 90, it's like 40% risk of getting dementia. So it's, it's um, you know, it's almost one out of three people are going to get dementia when they get over 80. If you have a standard American diet and you're taking uh, uh, all these things and not getting much exercise. And they're terrified of this because it requires such, um, I mean, it requires residential treatment. Uh, you, you've got to go to a place and be taken care of in a, in a residential center. You, it costs so much to, to support that kind of um, problem at home. Yeah. Most people can't afford it. And even if they and go that, into care, they're understaffed in those facilities. Yes, and if you do, if you're at home, if if you're a spouse with dementia and you're caring for them, um, uh, the majority of people develop depression. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's devastating, and in a family situation, if there's is an extended family, that depression has a, a broad effects on the entire family. So. We've got the biggest generation of baby boomers coming up here, moving into their, um, towards their 80s. They're already, 5% of us already have dementia, and 5 or 6%. I mean, that's conservative figures. And we're headed 40% of us will have it in our 80s. Got it. That's a huge population how big the baby boom pop how are you going to deal with all those people they're afraid it'll destroy uh the medical system in terms of uh, insurers yeah um 
hate to brighten your Friday with that news, but maybe it'll inspire you to start exercising regularly, watch your diet regularly, use neurofeedback and everything at your disposal to take care of yourself so you're not a burden to your family and the community <laughs> and the country. Right. And when we start talking about holistic health care and functional neurofeedback, raise that flag and salute it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think about that now because I've, you know, I'm, I turned 72 last month. And uh, so I'm, a, I'm approaching that, you know, so I'm, I, I try to stay as, you know, as focused as I can on healthy diet and getting out and getting exercise. Uh, Rob, it's never going to happen to you. <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> you, you burn at such a high rate. <laughs> Maybe I'll just burn out. <laughs> You'll be like, yeah, I just still driving uh, all day long, Florida to New York at 90. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're still driving a lot. I um, am, but yeah, those are those are very scary statistics, and for us to think about in terms of just you know, people around us, and the population, the economy, the healthcare system, everything seems to be you know, uh, uh, on a very delicate teeter tottering balance right now. Yeah, it it, it does. Um, uh, well, we've kicked a lot of big cans down the road, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to face some music on them. In the meantime, there's uh, extreme s silliness in our government, uh, yeah. serious stuff. Uh, uh, we've got to get to work, not, not point fingers at each other. But in this uh, uh, case, you can see that when the person opens their eyes, Things get a lot more serious, don't they? Yeah, everything's lit up like a Christmas tree, and it looks like, uh, like you said, at least in at least in the delta and theta range, at least two standard deviations. Yeah. You know, for the whole damn brain, and maybe more hmm. because when it's all yellow, we don't know. There's not another color beyond that. Um, and alpha's getting there, and beta's getting there, but some of that beta might be being influenced, I imagine, by the high beta, right? Oh, it's all that. That's all. Look at that globally. He's probably got beta much. Well, that's common. There's a lot more um, rigidity uh, in the muscles um, uh, with the stretch receptors. There's, you know, um, you lose function and uh, you get global EMG, you know. Yeah. And then the sad part to me, I, my my father, this lady friend that uh, they're together up in New York, and she's he's ninety, going to be ninety five this coming year, but he's she's eighty seven, I think. She has dementia, and it's, when you go to visit with them, besides the fact that they keep their apartment at somewhere between seventy eight and eighty degrees, I can't imagine living in that uh, yeah, day to day. It's common. It's common though, yeah. Uh, you know, if she's awake, she's awake and watching TV, but then she dozes off. So she spends a good piece of her day sleeping. So she's not even activating her brain. She's just out. Yeah. Well, it's not really sleep a lot of times. It's an, it's a, a, an altered state um, uh, where they're in between the conscious world and the unconscious world. And, oh, they're, okay. and they're having, like, uh, dreams, mild hallucinations. They, uh, with Louis Body, uh, they'll talk to people all the time that aren't there, um, and uh, have animated conversations with um, who knows who they're talking to in their head. Uh, but it's 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 what happens when we lose, you know, the outside world becomes less clear and the inside world becomes um, more active and. Uh, um, it's really an altered state. It's a pathological state. Hmm. I mean, I no doubt there's sleep too, but. Yeah, well, maybe you're, I mean, I, I, that makes sense. I mean, you can have a conversation and sometimes she'll just all of a sudden make a comment and you think, yeah, oh, I thought you were asleep. That's, so that's you're, right. when you're 
talking about that twilight zone state that must be mm -hmm. where she's at yeah that's where she's at that's where they're at i know i my mother had dementia and i was around for the um as she declined and i um had an EEG on her the whole time uh, of, of the later decline, and uh, and I studied her. I went and fed her every day at the at the residential center and uh, um, uh, both you know at breakfast, lunch a lot of times, and uh, I talked to her and I knew what was going on. I was teaching psychology <laughs> in, in uh, at several. Um, uh, colleges and university I was uh, adjunctively teaching it while I was doing my neurofeedback practice uh, um, and uh, I was totally aware of what happening and uh, I was exploring what was happening and you know I read the research and I test out things talk to her say things to her look at her responses what she ate how she reacted um, it was a real lesson for me. Yeah, being around Vivian, that's her name, is is interesting to me too because she will ask the same thing over again, which I understand. But depending on the topic, she'll almost sound like she's with the program. She can she mm -hmm. can converse like a little bit about like politics or a TV show or whatever. And then her eating habits range from I'm not hungry. That's to, yeah. To having, I mean, she'll eat a, like a, a huge meal. It's like, wow, where'd you put all that stuff? <laughs> and it changes. And as it advances, they eat less and less. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. They, and they have to be fed. Uh, um, and, of course, you have to be watched because, you know, osteoporosis set in as you age and you could right. fall. And if, you get the, if there's a broken hip, a large percentage of the time, that's the end of the story right there. Yeah. yeah, she's fallen several times. It hasn't broken anything. She's you really know, lucky. She's really quite lucky, yeah. Well, she's small and kind of frail, too, so uh, who knows? But, yeah, that, those are those are things I've observed, you know, with, with her as well. Um, those are apparently are uh, what you would see in someone who's got dementia. Well, we can see the frontal delta here. Yeah. Right? And they're slowing. I would expect there to be a lot more slowing. But he was he was still able to um, relate. And the uh, degree in QBG, a rule is that the degree of deviance isn't the isn't the same doesn't correlate with the degree of symptomology. Mm. You'll never see that correlation because people are individually so different. And you can look, one person can have a map like this and be just chair bound and not with it, not even present. And another person like this guy can be walking around. So you can't always judge severity um, by the level of deviance of the EEG. Um, it, it's amazing. Uh, some people have a lot more... Um, fiber pathways they've developed and the more intelligence a person has the longer they stay clear because of the fiber pathways they've developed yeah yeah you know, when i uh when i am mentoring folks or consulting i'll say if you had 10 people who had the same basic condition just take whatever disorder and you map and you have I, you know, 10 very similar looking maps. So things, same symptoms, same looking kind of map. And then you look at outcome with health and neurofeedback or whatever, you could have 10 different outcomes. <laughs> yeah. There's no, there's no written rule here about this. Again, it comes down to individual differences. Individual. Yep, individual differences. Exactly. And that's where our medical system fails so many people because it's, it's trying to get a, a one size fits all um, thing that the insurance companies can measure so that they can fund things and it's uh nobody's taking note of the fact that that's where the or nobody wants to note that that's where the failure is i expect because they don't know how to deal with it i mean i haven't seen any good plans for that how do you we've got to take care of people individually and yet the cost would be astronomical and you can't 
run insurance on that basis, the way we've been running it. So it's a real catch-22. And what are you going to do with all these people? I mean, in five years, it's going to be a really major problem. Of course, with climate change, we may be looking at other things. But um, here's the uh, delta, and contributing to it is slowed alpha. You can see it's uh, even more frontal than posterior, and that's typical. And then, I mean, the theta, sorry. And then here's the delta. And so that's what you expect in a map. Now, what's interesting about this guy is look at the hypocoherence. It's not only, bad. Not bad. No. The hypercoherence is is his um is there, and, and I expect there to be hypercoherence, and yeah. there would and there is some. I expect more, but there is some. But the literature on coherence indicates that loss of function is usually reflected in um, hypocoherence, especially in the beta range. And so there you go. The research for looking finds a general pattern, but here's a guy who doesn't fit it, who's no. still walking and talking. Now, of course, his eyes close would look pretty good, but when he opens his eyes, he may be on the edge of a shift, but he's still good. Yeah, and, when I see those maps, is when we've gone over them, when I see a number like that, I typically expect to see, and it's not always yeah. true, as we all know, but I expect to see the T3, T4, maybe T5, T6 start yeah. to drop out. A little bit of memory or emotional disconnect, but that's not too terribly bad. That's like the beginning of it. That's You're right, yeah. this guy's functioning I'll bet pretty you well. He has, has that too, and I, I don't have the actual map. I just took pictures yeah. and we're chatting right. about it. And... Uh, alpha asymmetry, this is almost universal depression. A depression is usually uh, precedes dementia and develops as dementia develops. And um, depression uh, in your 30s and 40s is one of the predict, again, only one of the predictors of dementia in old age. But You've got to remember everybody takes those drugs now when they're depressed. And we didn't have as much dementia when people weren't taking those drugs. That's, I guess that's the fly now, pay later, uh, pay later plan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did I get... No, that's not... I don't know what that is. Well, um, I just thought that would be a really good thing to look at. Um, how, what do you do with that? All the people, all the research that's been done that I've seen so far is um, training delta uh, and theta. And theta is the one they've trained down the most because the people who did those studies and neurofeedback apparently didn't know any of the research on EEG and that was done in the 20th century, and that should be embarrassing. They just trained the theta down, and uh, but that's speeding the alpha up, and they trained fast alpha up, and that's speeding the alpha up. And so training theta down and alpha speeding the alpha up is good. What else speeds alpha up? SMR. Yeah. So you can train <laughs> SMR up and delta and theta down and probably get much better results than all of these studies because they didn't know better and they should have asked somebody who was a practitioner at ISNR. But, you know, these guys think they can read something and just do the experiment and uh, that's enough. But you've got to be a clinician to really exper do experiments with neurofeedback. Yeah. Well, speaking of SMR and looking at, you know, a map like this, I would, if I were training SMR, I would, I would just keep it at 13 to 15. I and mean, even though the alpha looks to be okay, if the alpha were low, 
then I would leave it at 12 to 15, but that's usually my, my take oh. on working with SMR. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, I, you know, both, it would be worthwhile to try both yeah. and yeah. look at what your trend screen tells you. And that's ultimately the thing. If delta and theta is too much for the client, if they've got too much delta and it's too big a, a, a stretch for them to get delta and theta down, you can focus on the theta down and, um, and watch your trend screen. And you might find that the, they change even more. You know, you get more delta down by training the theta down. That's not uncommon, happens all the time. So there's no magic here and you don't have to go to, well, let me find the region of interest and put a full cap on these people because they don't like anything like that. They'll be combative, they'll fight you. Uh, getting a full cap on somebody with dementia is often a serious problem. And it's overkill and it's unnecessary. All you have to do is get a, an electrode at CZ and start training. Um, and that's a good start. Mm -hmm. And you can move forward, train the frontal area next at FC and maybe start trying to train some uh, uh, F3, F4 and then go all the way front FP1, FP2. And that gets the arousal levels really up. So those are all good things to do. Uh, and then I would go to the back and start over again and train at every, every mm -hmm. uh, hom homologous location. I train um, protocol two or three back to front and do it again and again and again. Five sessions. Once you go through that first part, do five sessions at every location. Go back to front. And I... Uh, yeah advise that for mentoring and a lot of people had good results i did the same thing richard i said run five sessions of this run five of that once we get into 20 or 25 sessions let's assess how the person's doing and then yep. we'll go from there i agree because i like to work from back to front especially in a map like this i'd be doing the same thing five sessions just work everything and get that delta down in the back i'd probably use protocol one starting at c3 c4 t3 t4 and forward i'd probably use protocol number two yeah you can do four channel too isn't it? and, and I, I do a lot of that as you know yeah absolutely if they respond well after the first five sessions i'll combine them and uh do a four channel yep so that's dementia there's no magic trick there's no one protocol fits all look at the map look at your trend screen what gets you the best results? That is more related to functional neurofeedback than mm -hmm. the gizmo gang who's going to you know, try all kinds of experimental techniques on you. Well, that so, was good and quite informative. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah. good stuff. Thank you. Yeah, if it's, it's a lot of stuff, interesting stuff is falling out. Uh, you know, I've had this research in my folders and I've just gotten to it to, to review it all again, updating. And it's all this stuff is amazing how much new stuff is done. But even there's amazing stuff in the old literature, if you dig. Yeah. Well, have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye, everybody.